Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here today. Uh, for those of you who are uh, with us on the live stream, we appreciate your time to uh, spend with us to worship God together. And hopefully you are enriched by being a part of our service. Uh, of course, everything we try to do is to the glory of God. And so that is our focus. We'll just go over uh, some announcements as far as some upcoming events. One of the things that I want to mention is the men's breakfast. It's going to be here at the building at 9 o'clock. And uh, if you, obviously if you're of the male persuasion, then uh, you're asked to respond to an email that Dan Cuneo sent out about it. Now, the email was a trick. It's a trick. It's a two-fold purpose. One is to make sure you have a valid email address. That's the trick. And the incentive is the food. So, you know, please, please respond to the email, and uh, we hope to have uh, as many of you show up as possibly can. That is January 30th at 9 o'clock in the morning here at the building, the men's breakfast. Uh, just some updates. Um, things are not in the bulletin. One of the things that, that I did was uh, I received a message from my daughter, uh, from our daughter, Deborah. She wanted us to pass her greetings and love to each of you. Some of you may not realize this, but, you know, our children were born when we were members here. And uh, they have a very close attachment to this congregation. And you may not wear, be aware of that. Um, I know some of you feel that way towards them, but they also feel that way towards you. So what we did was we wrote their addresses down at school on this card. They were, they were a little disappointed. I mean, it's not anyone's fault. It's just what it is. But uh, they weren't able to say goodbye to you before they left for school. And they were looking forward to be able to do that. So I thought, well, I'll just drop their addresses down and I'll post them on the bulletin board. And if you'd like to send them a note or something, you have that available to you. Uh, some updates on the sick. Uh, Jennifer Price, if you want to remember her, she has an infection around her eye. Uh, it's pretty serious. Uh, they've been treating her with antibiotics to try to get that under control, and it seems like that has been working. And they're hoping that she will be able to come home today. She's in Robinson Hospital right now. So we want to remember that. Uh, I'm very sensitive myself to anything relating to the eye. And so when I hear about people that have that kind of eye trouble, I'm sensitive to that myself. So we're glad to hear that she's improving. Also, Adam Smith, uh, he did have surgery. He came home yesterday. Uh, we want to continue to remember him in prayer and also uh, the family as, they, uh, as he is recovering from that. And want to remember that family. Also, Liz Ramsey, uh, she's recovering from foot surgery. Um, she has diabetes. I don't think that's any anything to keep secret exactly, but those of you who are familiar with diabetes knows, know that infections are a complication. And so it's a very serious situa situation. Uh, they're having trouble getting her wound to heal. So we want to remember her and our prayers as well. Uh, there's some information about um, the Hicks and their child. Uh, it's in the bulletin, so we want to continue to remember that. And, and I'm not going to mention all the people in the bulletin. But I will mention this, if you're not getting the bulletin, uh, you can send an email to webmaster at streetsborochurch.org and they can add you to the list. So I'm not gonna mention all the sick. I wanna mention uh, Bobby's uh, mother-in-law, Shelly's mother, uh, Susan Cook. Uh, she's in the hospital in Akron. She's having tests uh, to try to deal with some issues relating to her heart. Uh, so we wanna remember them uh, as well. Are there any other announcements or anything that I overlooked? If not, then let us begin our worship together. Good morning. Our first selection this morning will be number 870. Number 870. <clears throat> it's been a little while, so bear with me if I don't get it just right. <clears throat> I'm happy today, oh yes, I'm happy today, in Jesus Christ, I'm happy today, because he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm happy today. I'm singing today, oh yes, I'm singing today, in Jesus Christ, I'm singing today. 
selection will be number 810. Number 810. <clears throat> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come humbly bowed before you in prayer. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for your love and for your care for each one of us. Thankful for the night's rest in our warm homes and comfortable beds, and we're thankful for the health and strength to be able to be up this morning, to be able to come together to worship you, to praise your name in song, and to 
lift up to you our prayers, Heavenly Father, and we know, Heavenly Father, that you'll hear our prayers and that you'll answer them in accordance with your word and with your will. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for each one who is able to worship with us this morning, for those who have been able to be here in person and those who are online. We just pray that we might be edified and lifted up and strengthened and encouraged and that our faith might grow and that we might be able to be out in the world and to be the Christians that you'd have us to be, Heavenly Father, to stand up for the truth, to overcome those things that tempt us, Heavenly Father, and we know that you'll provide for us that way of escape if we just look for it, Heavenly Father, and willingly use that way that you provide for us. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are unable to worship with us this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are sick and recovering from illnesses and surgeries. We continue to pray, Heavenly Father, for Adam, that you'd be with him, thankful that he is improving and able to be home. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Sister Jan, and we're thankful that the infection is, um, they're being able to heal that, and we pray that she would continue to do so and be able to be home with her family soon. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the medical treatment that we have in this country. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with Liz and that her foot would be able to heal and they would be able to help her. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd also be with Susan as she's going through testing for her heart that they can figure out what's going on and be able to help her. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with the doctors and nurses and those in the medical field that care for us, Heavenly Father, and provide for us the treatments that we need. And we're thankful that you've given them that wisdom and the ability to do so. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the spiritually sick. We pray that we might reach out to them and encourage them and and direct them to your word that can heal them, Heavenly Father, and that can help them to be on the right path, to be able to be um, heading down the way that would be faithful to you. We pray that we might all, Heavenly Father, continue to read and study your word and, and use it to help us to grow and to remain strong. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our country. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bless it. We pray for the leaders, Heavenly Father, that They might do the things that are right in your sight and make the decisions that are pleasing to you and that are a benefit to the country as a whole. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you help us to continue to pray for them, even though we might not agree with everything that they do, Heavenly Father, but know that they are in place because of you. And we know that your will will be done in all things, Heavenly Father, and that you are still in control. Pray that we might always look to you and trust you to do the things that you know that are best for us as we know that you will. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with us as we continue to worship you this morning. We pray that you would be with all those who are taking part to make this worship worship possible. Pray that all things are said and done that are pleasing in your sight, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you be with Brother Ralph as he brings us a lesson this morning. Give him a remembrance of those things that he has prepared and that might bring them forth in a way that we might understand them and that we would apply them to our lives. <clears throat> We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for our Savior Jesus and the great sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, for that great love that was shown for mankind and the salvation that we can have through the shedding of his blood, and that it might wash away our sins if we are obedient to your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, would help us to look to that ultimate goal, which is heaven, to use that to get, keep us on the straight path, Heavenly Father. And we're so thankful for that hope that we have, and we look forward to the day when we can be in heaven with you and with all of our brothers and sisters. We ask now that you be with us throughout this day and on through our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, we're going to use hymn number 203 to help prepare our hearts and our minds. Number 203. <clears throat> Man of sorrow, what a name. here who does not have their communion packet okay. Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse 12 therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You heard in the reading the word condemnation. 
Condemnation is the judicial act of declaring one guilty and dooming them to punishment. A sentence of judgment which condemns someone to do, to give, or to pay something. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, you, me, every one of us, all mankind are condemned because of our sin. But thanks be for the grace of God. His mercy has been offered to us for we could not pay the price necessary for our pardon. Therefore, as we read in verse 18, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Back up in verse 8, it says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid his iniquity, or has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for our pardon. It was he and he only who could pay the necessary price worthy of our freedom and salvation. And we remember that now, that gift of his life for us. Paul recounted in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus himself declaring the supper as a memorial to him. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us give thanks for the bread. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your gift to us. The gift of your Son, who is willing to go to the cross and give his life in an agonizing way for each and every one of us. We ask you, Father, to be with us as we partake of this bread that represents his body, the body that was crucified on the cross. Father, be with us and help us to do so in a mind and manner pleasing with thee. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let us also give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blood that cleanses us from our sins that was shed on Calvary's cross. 
We ask you to be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, that we might do so in a mind and manner pleasing with thee. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Having concluded the Lord's Supper, we take this as an opportune time to, in remembering what, what was done for us, the price that was paid, the gift of Jesus. To fulfill the commandment, the responsibility, and the privilege of giving a portion of what God has blessed us with to the work of the church. It's commanded in 1 Corinthians 16. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in store. But I would like to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As Paul says, For this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes it in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. God is the giver of every good, perfect gift. The blessings that we receive on a daily basis to sustain our lives and the abundance that we have, that we are given, is all a blessing from Him. God loves a cheerful giver. Let us go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so indeed thankful for all the gifts that you give us daily, for the talents that you grant us, for the blessings, we're so thankful, Father. And we ask you, Father, to continue to bless us as you see our need. Father, at this time, as we give a portion of what you have blessed us with to the work of your kingdom, we pray that you will be with us, that we will do so with honest and cheerful hearts, wanting to please you, spread your word, and help those who are in need. In Jesus' holy name, amen. There's three ways that you can give. For those of you who are here present, because of the COVID, we're not passing the collection plate, which is our custom. Instead, we have a box on the back wall where you can drop your contribution in. If you are watching online, and worshiping with us online, you can send your contribution by way of mail. You can send it to the P.O. box, and I do not remember that number because I've never used it. Uh, but uh, if you don't know that number, reach out to us and uh, we'll get you that P.O. box number. Uh, or you can uh, make arrangements to drop it off here at the building. If you don't have a key to the building, just contact one of us. Thank you. Before Brother Ralph brings our lesson this morning, we're going to sing the first and last verse of number 730. Number 730. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus.
you'd like to mark the song of encouragement after the lesson, it will be number 655. Number 655. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Again, that's book of James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he and who gives to all liberally and will without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a doubtful, doubtful mind, double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Good morning. morning. Before we begin today, I want to take a moment just to express my gratitude to the congregation here. I'm sure I'm speaking for Jennifer as well, for all the prayers and concern that you all have, have expressed for her. We're grateful that she got the good care that she's gotten, and hopefully we'll be getting to come home today. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to having her home. I heard someone ask Sean, I don't think he heard, but someone asked Sean, how you eating, Sean? And well, he would probably say great. He said uh, calzones and pizza rolls and uh, <laughs> fried bologna and mac and cheese and things like that. But we're we're looking forward to. I told Jen one blessing in disguise is there's fewer dishes because we're eating out. <laughs> there's not as many dishes to do, but we look forward to getting her home. And I know she's looking forward to getting home and getting cleaned up and getting a good night's rest as well. One thing that I forgot to ask David to announce is uh, I talked with Dayton the past, this past week, and Dayton's doing much better, but he did mention that Chris Hickerson, his daughter-in-law, Denny's wife, you know, she has bone cancer, and she is not doing well at all. So please keep uh, the Hickerson family in your prayers as, uh, you know, Chris is, is dealing with this uh, bone cancer and not doing well. Last week, in our study in the book of James, we noticed that James has encouraged us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. And we talked about how that's possible. We know that it's not joyful to go through trials. If it were, they wouldn't be trials. But we can have a joyful spirit or attitude about us knowing that good can come from the trials that we face. Uh, namely, James mentions patience perseverance that we gain from enduring those trials. We've talked also about the fact that we know that those trials are temporary and that there's a far a greater reward waiting for us when this life is over. Now James is going to move on to a quality that every child of God needs to, pos to possess, and that is wisdom. And coupled with this mention of wisdom here, he talks about praying for wisdom and he talks about the importance of the one praying to be praying with faith that God will answer that prayer and to not be what he terms a double-minded man. We're going to talk about what that means as we move on. So as we begin to dig into our passage, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, James says in James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. As we often do, I think, first of all, let us define what wisdom is. We are to, if we lack wisdom, we are to ask God for it, but what is it? First of all, we know that knowledge isn't the same thing as wisdom. Knowledge is the acquisition of, of facts, of information. There are people who know a lot of stuff, and we say those people are very intelligent individuals. However, it's very possible and often very common for very intelligent people to be very unwise people. Wisdom is different. 
A dictionary definition of the word wisdom is the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Okay? Read that again one more time. The soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. So when we're talking about wisdom, we're talking about the way in which we use the knowledge that we have. And are we using good judgment in the decisions that we make? So wisdom, then, is that quality that allows us to use the knowledge that we possess in a correct way. Some have said that a good synonym, if you will, for the word wisdom is common sense. And that is true. Uh, and we know that common sense is often a very uncommon thing. One preacher that I admire, his definition, and you've heard me say this before, is that wisdom is that ability to know how today's decision is going to affect tomorrow. To know if I decide this today, this is most likely what's going to happen down the road, and then choose accordingly for the best outcome. We're told by God numerous times and in numerous ways that we ought to be seeking wisdom in our everyday lives. We think about Proverbs, which is a, a book of wisdom written by Solomon, wise Proverbs that are listed there for us. I want to read a, a lengthy passage from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 here, where God, through Solomon, who is writing to his son, encourages us to seek after wisdom. He says, My son, if you receive the, my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom, so we have the idea of a father speaking to the son, a father who is older and has more experience and therefore more wisdom, speaking to his son and saying, listen to me and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. Things And I honestly could read the whole uh, chapter of Proverbs chapter 2, and it would apply to the topic at hand today. And that is that, again, Solomon is, is begging his son to uh, listen to wisdom and accept wisdom from his mouth. And God certainly does that with you and I as our Heavenly Father. He wants us to have wisdom. He wants to impart wisdom to us. And when we have, when we gain that wisdom, that experience, if you will, it will make our lives much better. Uh, we often hear people say, I wish I, I knew then what I know now. Uh, looking back at decisions we have made in the past and, and years of experience that have, uh, we have lived through have taught us so that we would have made a different decision in the past and things would have turned out better. But the application of wisdom will vastly improve in our lives. In chapter 3 of Proverbs, verses 13 through 18, Solomon says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. Notice here that Solomon says we ought to desire wisdom more than the profits of silver and the gain of fine gold. He says that... Um, Wisdom should be more precious to us than rubies. Beginning in verse 16, he lists some of those benefits. 
Length of days is in her right hand. In other words, the idea that uh, you'll be you'll you'll have a better life. You'll live a better life if you apply wisdom. And the idea of length of days in her right hand to the Jew a lot that had a, a connotation to uh, being in the promised land. And God had told the Jews that as long as they did His will and were obedient, their days would be prolonged in the promised land. This is not suggesting that wisdom will automatically give us longevity of life, but rather that we will continue in the good graces of God and we will live a better life as a result of it. And he says also in her left hand, riches and honor. Generally speaking, those who exercise wisdom in their lives, they do better financially uh, than those who do not. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and her paths are peace. So we definitely will benefit from the application of godly wisdom in our lives. So what is wisdom? Proper application of knowledge really is the best uh, definition. And wisdom is something we need to seek for. Wisdom is something that will greatly improve our lives in every way. So we need that experience. We need that, that ability to know how to use the information we have in the right way. Well, James then goes on to tell us that if we lack that wisdom, we are to ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. So those who lack wisdom are to ask God for it. I don't know of too many people who, who are willing to admit that they lack wisdom, uh, but I think it's safe to say there are times in all of our lives that we lack wisdom. We may have a lot of information. We may know all of the facts, but we don't really know what to do with those facts and what decision to make. I think back just a couple days ago when Jennifer got, had her infection and, and we knew that something was wrong and she had seen her doctor and was on antibiotics, but it wasn't getting any better. And we didn't know, should we go to the hospital? Should she go to the ER and have it checked out or wait until Monday to see her doctor again? And so we had the information, but we didn't really know what to do. Thankfully, she made, she made a wise choice and went to the hospital because that needed to be treated immediately. So, but there are times when we have information, but we don't know what to do with it. When we need that wisdom, God wants us to ask him for it. He will give, he will give us the wisdom we need. And he will do that without reproaching us, without making us feel bad for asking. I think one of the most wonderful examples of this, and I'm sure you're probably thinking this yourself, is Solomon again. You remember he, he was made king of Israel and he felt very overwhelmed by the task before him and he asked God for wisdom. 1 Kings 3 verses 5 through 9. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Can you imagine having that offer made to you by God himself? All the thing, I mean, obviously there's nothing that God is unable to give, and so he's basically giving Solomon a blank check here. What do you want, Solomon? What can I give you? Solomon says, You've shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. How many, how many young men do you know who are willing to say, I am a little child? I think Solomon's request that he's about to make in this prayer to God here, demonstrates that he already possessed a good bit of wisdom, um, but he, needed, he felt he needed more. He says, I'm but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So on the one hand, we have Solomon here who was very humble and, again, demonstrated a degree of wisdom in knowing that he lacked wisdom, and he asked God for that wisdom. You remember, though, Solomon's son who took over after Solomon? His name was Rehoboam. 
He was just the opposite from his father. He wouldn't listen to the wise counsel that was given to him, and he was a failure as a king. But here we have Solomon, who again is given that blank check by God, and he asks God for wisdom. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story without reading on. God gives Solomon that wisdom, and and now Solomon is given his wisdom, I believe, in a, in a miraculous way, okay? God miraculously gives him wisdom. I'm not saying that he's definite that he will do that in a miraculous way for us. How is it that God gives us wisdom today? How does that take place? I have a couple, a couple ideas. The Bible doesn't say, James doesn't say, he says, ask God and he'll give it to you. Doesn't say how. But let me suggest a couple possibilities of, of ways that God can give us wisdom. Number one, we've already noticed a passage that tells us one way that God will give us wisdom. That was back in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So one of the ways that God gives wisdom is through his mouth, from his word, we can gain much wisdom. Uh, when we read, you know, when we think about the Old Testament and we understand we don't live under the law of the Old Testament today, but I hope we understand there is much to learn there and we can learn and gain wisdom from both the mistakes and the successes that those people made uh, in the past. And, and then again, you read books like Proverbs and Psalms and in those books of the wisdom literature, and there is so much wisdom to be imparted from God's Word. A firm grasp, a firm understanding of God's Word will help us to discern good from evil. That's what Solomon was asking for, and that's something that we need to ask for and seek for, the ability to discern from uh, good from evil. You remember in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, the Hebrew writer was... Um, rebuking his audience because the time had come when they should be teachers, but they needed someone to teach them again the first principles of the oracles of God. And, and he uses that illustration of you need milk and not solid food. You should be on solid food by now, but you still need milk. You need to be taught the basics. But down in uh, Hebrews 5 and verse 14, he says solid food, talking about the more difficult aspects or topics of the scriptures, solid foods belong to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. A firm knowledge of God's word will give us the ability to, to discern good from evil in the world around us. And as long as we continue to use that as, a, as our guide, we'll always know right from wrong. So God is able to give us knowledge and give us wisdom from his word. It comes from his mouth. Beyond this, I also believe that God is capable of giving us wisdom by means of our life experiences, things that we go through in this life. Much wisdom simply comes from living through certain events, certain things that have occurred by, by making mistakes and hopefully learning from those mistakes. So I believe that when we ask God for wisdom, that he can and that he often does work through his providential care in order to give us those experiences that we need to gain the wisdom, the understanding in our lives. We sometimes, in a, in a limited way, do this with our children. There are some things that children just need to learn for themselves. You can tell them, you shouldn't eat all that candy. It's going to make you sick. But it's not something that very often they will listen to until they find out, well, yeah, that's right, it does. And I didn't like that. And so they gain wisdom through the experiences. So when we go to God in prayer, we understand that one of the ways that he can give us the wisdom for which we ask is by, like we allow our children maybe to do something because they need to learn the lesson themselves. He will allow us to endure trials, go through troubles. Maybe it's not a trial. Maybe it's a, a, some kind of success in our life, but the experiences that we have will give us the wisdom that we need. 
Those are two ways. Uh, through, through his providential care, uh, allowing us to have the experiences we need, to have the wisdom that we want. And number two, again, he gives us wisdom through his word. And so there is a, an imperative there on us to be students of that word. He can't give us wisdom if we're not willing to listen to what he has to say. Other than that, you know, regardless of how God chooses to impart wisdom to us, the passage tells us very plainly that if we ask for it, he'll give it to us. We'll have the wisdom that we need. So moving on now, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So in regard to petitioning God in prayer, we have to go to him in prayer in faith. And James tells us basically what he means by that in faith with no doubting. That's what he means by going to God in, in faith, to do it with no doubting. Now, of course, we know that statement is true in regard to all prayer, not just in regard to a prayer for wisdom. Uh, any prayer that we offer to God, we need to go to him in faith. We must trust God that he's going to answer our prayer in the way that is best for us. The wise Christian understands that many times our wisdom is different than God's wisdom and God's wisdom is better than ours and we may ask for things that wouldn't be good for us or someone else. And so we understand then as Christians that there may be times that God's answer is no. And we accept that, but we trust him to answer the prayer in the way that is best for us. We talked about faith recently in one of our lessons, but remember, that's really part of what faith is, is trusting God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, which I evidently have left out of our slides there. But Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, uh, part of faith is believing that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And we've talked about that. But going along with that is trusting him to answer prayers. And we know that as long as our prayers are in accordance with God's will, he will grant those prayers to us. John tells us in 1 John 5, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So as long as we ask according to his will, we understand his will is what's best for us. So we trust his knowledge. We trust his wisdom. We will have our prayers granted. Now, think about this as applied to asking for wisdom, though. Asking for wisdom would never be against the will of God, would it? He, he wants us to have wisdom. He wants us to desire it. He wants us to seek after it. And so that's why James, by inspiration, can say so boldly, if you ask for wisdom, God will give it to you. And I know some are thinking, yeah, watch out. Yeah, God will give it to you. But God will give you wisdom. That's something that he wants us to possess. It's according to his will. So we can rest assured he will give us the wisdom that we need. Now, if we doubt God, if we ask him for something but yet then doubt God, we're told that we will not receive anything from him. James says that the one who goes to God in prayer and then at the same time doubts God's ability or God's desire to answer that prayer, he describes him as double-minded. That word double-minded, in the Greek it literally means two spirits. He's of two spirits. Um, it's a person who is uh, confused, spiritually speaking, you might say. This word is one that James is the only one in the New Testament who uses it. He uses it here, and he also uses it over in James chapter 4. Let's look there, verses 4 through 8. James says, adulterers and adulteresses, why does he use that phrase? He's talking to people who are spiritually unfaithful to God. Okay, they're cheating on God, so to speak. That's what a double-minded person is. 
Do you not know what that friendship with the world is enmity with God? He's describing a double-minded person. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you, there's our word, double-minded. A double-minded person or double-minded people are those who try to serve two masters. James describes them as adulterers and adulteresses because you have a person who on the one hand wants to claim fealty and loyalty and love to God, but on the other hand, they love the world. And by loving the world, I mean the sinfulness in the world. They love sin and they want to be part of that as well. And so they're double-minded. They have two spirits about them. Their loyalties are divided, and we cannot serve God with divided loyalties. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man, uh, mammon. So in our example, Jesus uses God and, and filthy riches. That's what the word mammon means. We can't serve two gods. So there are people who um, are double-minded. They're of two spirits. On one hand, they, they claim fealty to God and that they're a servant of God. But on the other hand, they don't act that way. And if, if we go to God in prayer and don't trust him to answer the prayer, we're double-minded. And this, this double-mindedness, it manifests itself more than in just our prayer lives, Okay. Yes, it will manifest in prayer life, going to God in prayer and then wondering, well, is he really going to you know, hear me and answer? Uh, it manifests itself in other ways. And, and we're going to just think about this for a moment here. Some examples. Uh, number one, <clears throat> a double-minded Christian is one who on one hand strives to serve God, but on the other wants to be like the world. We've already mentioned this a little bit. 1 John uh, 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world. And when we say the world there, we're not talking about the physical creation. We're talking about the world outside of Christ, okay? We're talking about the sinful world. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Also, we can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where we are encouraged. Uh, I'm sorry, boy, I should have checked these better. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, which is not in our, on our screen, where Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? A double-minded person is one who tries to live in both worlds. He tries to abide in light, but he also wants to walk in darkness, and that simply is not possible. A double-minded Christian also is one who lives like a Christian one day of the week, and the other six days of the week they live like the world. You wouldn't know that they were Christians by the way that they behave. A double-minded Christian would be one who speaks one way when he is around other Christians, and he speaks another way when he is around the world, uh, members of the world who are not Christians. He, he, he won't curse, and he'll talk about good things when he's around Christians, but get him away from that Christian influence, and he sounds and talks just like everyone else in the world. A double-minded man is one who is outwardly religious, but inwardly of the devil. And that's the passage that is on your screen now. Matthew 23, 27, the scribes and Pharisees met this, were in this category. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that's a double-minded person right there, a hypocrite. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inward, inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. They put on this wonderful facade for the world to see, but inside they were full of uncleanness. They were double-minded in all their ways. 
A double-minded Christian maybe is one who spends a few minutes a week reading or thinking about God's Word a few minutes a week in prayer and then spends hours and hours upon hours of time watching television shows that they ought not to watch, maybe reading things that they ought not to read. So you have God getting a couple minutes of their time a week and then everything else getting hours and hours. We ought to be concerned about God's Word and want to know it so that we can apply it to our lives. Like Paul says in Philippians 4, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Those are the things we need to be focusing on and, and not wasting all of our time on worldly pursuits. So a double-minded person is a person who is really a hypocrite. They try to, they live two lives. One life, it appears that they're faithful servants of God, but on the other hand, they doubt him when they go to him in prayer. They don't live as a Christian ought to live um, every day of their lives. They don't behave as a Christian ought to behave every, every day of their lives. Now James tells us, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So he's not going to answer our prayers. That's how James is applying it here. You can ask for wisdom, but if you doubt, he's not going to give it to you. So that applies to our prayers, certainly. Proverbs 1, verses 28 to 31, God says in regard to the unrighteous, he says, they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel, despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancy. So he's saying there, when the trials come on them, I'm not, I'm not going to answer their prayers. They weren't willing to listen. They haven't listened. They haven't obeyed. I'm not going to answer their prayers. The double-minded man should not expect God to answer his prayers. Even more than that, that, James says he won't receive anything from the Lord. Not just in regard to prayer. We're not going to receive anything from the Lord. So I would suggest to you that that also implies salvation. We won't receive salvation from the Lord if we're double-minded, if we're hypocrites, if we're trying to live in the world and in Christ at the same time. Remember what Jesus said. I, I, I think he's describing double-minded people in a way in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to conclude with this passage. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. <clears throat> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. We have people here who are calling on the Lord. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Again, there's a godly side to them. They, they appear righteous. But Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this is a picture of the judgment. And where there are going to be people on the judgment who are religious people who claim loyalty to Christ, to God, to the Holy Spirit, but Jesus says they practice lawlessness, so they are double-minded. On one hand, they're claiming a, a fealty to God, but on the other hand, they're serving the devil. He says, don't think you're going to receive anything from me, and that includes salvation. Jesus will tell them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Brother, in my hope and my prayer, I don't want to be double-minded. I want to have a, a singular focus on doing God's will, knowing God's will, of seeking the wisdom that he so richly offers us so that I can make the right decisions in my life that are pleasing to him. I don't want to be one of these people on the judgment that says, Lord, Lord, look at all that I did. But yet he knows I'm practicing lawlessness. As we conclude the lesson today, if there are any here who... As you look at your life, you realize that you've been double-minded in a way. You, 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 on one hand, you, you try to live the way that God wants, but on the other hand, you also are living in the world and doing the things that the world does, and you want to make that right. 
You need to make that right. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that first and foremost. Obeying the gospel involves believing that Jesus is the Son of God, confessing your faith in Jesus, repenting of your sins, and being baptized that those sins might be washed away. But then once that's done, you understand you've got to continue to walk in the light. You've got to continue to be faithful until death. So maybe there are some who have obeyed the gospel, but again, you're, you've become double-minded. You're not living a way that a Christian ought to live. If that's the case, then you simply need to repent, turn from the sin in your life, ask God's forgiveness, and he'll give it. As we conclude the lesson, if there's any way we can help for those here, we encourage you to come. For those watching online, we encourage you to get in touch. If you want to obey the gospel or you need help in some way, please let us know. We'll do what we can to help. Let us come as we stand and sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste away to its brink. Is the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. chosen to be with us this morning, but also those that are online worshiping with us there, we thank you for that also. Please remember our midweek Bible study on Wednesday at 730. If you can be here, that would be great, but also it would be live stream also if you can join us that way. Before we're dismissed this morning, we're going to sing the first and last of number 450. Number 450. <clears throat> Nearer my
Let's pray together. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We've had to come together and offer you our worship. We pray that by being here together, by worshiping you, we've honored and glorified your great name. And we've thought about how much you've blessed us, all the things you've done for us, the ways you take care of us, the hope of heaven that we have. We're so thankful for Jesus. He was willing to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray that this time together has edified and uplifted each one of us. We'll be stronger as, as the week goes on. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us as we separate and go out and, and go to our homes and do our work in this coming week, that we can always be a good example to the world around us, We'll always be doing the work that's before us to, sp to spread your kingdom. Father, we pray now that you'll bless us as we separate and watch over us until we meet again. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.